All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for May 10th, 2021. This is the time of the week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Katni, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, considering pur consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified of the changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you would like to subscribe to that. This meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. A video of this meeting is posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find that this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video that you can use uh, the doc to view only the parts that interest you most. This meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. A link to the notes document is posted to the CircuitPython dev channel and the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest doc. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, a look at um, all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It is a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is state of, or the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers. The third part is hug reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Uh, status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, take a couple minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting, and what you're going to be up to over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These can, discussions can come out of Status Updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for Status Updates. And that is the meeting. Um, and with that, I'll find my place and we will get started with community news. So first up, uh, celebrating Mother's Day by making. Um, there is, uh, and thank you Foamy Guy for getting the links, an animated flower running on CircuitPython LED animations example on Raspberry Pi Pico. Next up, Melanie McDonough made a Mother's Day project using an Adafruit mag tag with quotes from Glennon Doyle's book, Untamed. Uh, next up is KiCad 5.1.10 was released. Uh, the project announced the latest five stable series. The stable, this stable version contains critical bug fixes and other minor improvements since the last release. Um, next up, there's a video of running CircuitPython tests and fixing the resulting bugs. In CircuitPython, there are thousands of tests that verify the correct behavior of the core interpreter code. Here's a quick peek at how it looks to run those tests and one bug we recently discovered and fixed thanks to the tests. Next up, CircuitPythonista Ann Barella interviewed by Embedded FM. CircuitPython team member and newsletter editor, Ann Barella, was interviewed by Alicia and Christopher White on Embedded FM for issue 372, The Motivation of Creativity. In the podcast, Ann discusses her work with Adafruit to include tutorials, authoring two books on Adafruit products, and being retired from a 30-year career in engineering in the U.S. Foreign Service. And finally, uh, at least for us, and um, not, this is like I said, a preview of the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, uh, the Python programming language repository migrates to main on GitHub, and there is a blog post about that on Adafruit. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own newser project, edit next week's draft on GitHub, submit a pull request, 
um, or you can tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And that is community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is an opportunity to take a look at the project by the numbers. We'll talk about it in a few sections. First, we'll talk about it overall. Then I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. I will talk about the libraries. And this week, I will be talking about Blinka as well as Melissa is uh, otherwise occupied. So let's get started with that. Overall, and this applies to, um, like I said, the CircuitPython, or the CircuitPython core, all of the CircuitPython libraries, and Blinka as well, we had 72 pull requests merged by 27 authors. Um, there's a few names I don't recognize. Uh, Rodrigo Argumendo. Mm, scanning, scanning, scanning. Renpy Tom. Um, Jacev SM. Uh, TWA127. Um, those are names I don't recognize. There may be others as well. Um, and we had 15 reviewers, which is excellent. Um, in terms of issues, we had 47 issues closed by 18 people and 17 opened by 13 people. So we are very much net down um, by 30. I did that math right. Um, and that's how we're looking overall. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Thank you, Katni. Okay, numbers for the core. Uh, we had 27 pull requests merged from 16 different authors. Thank you to all of our authors. Um, I will read those off. We had eight reviewers, so thank you to all eight of you. We really appreciate it. We have 19 open pull requests. A few of those are quite old, so um, hopefully we'll get a, a glance at those sooner rather than later. Uh, but a number of them are also new too, and we're we're below 20. So I think generally we're doing good. We just have to, uh, if anybody wants to help out, um, picking up a, an old pull request is uh, is uh, really helpful <laughs> uh, to get those numbers down. And uh, there's some good stuff in there. That's why they're left open. So um, if you need help kind of getting your, your footing in a new PR, let me know. But um, I think a lot of these old ones are just like looking for a, a person to give them a little TLC and, and get them checked in. Um, issues wise, we had 11 closed issues by five people and eight opened by six people. So we're net down three, which is good. Uh, generally, we are tending upwards slowly. Uh, we have 443 open issues right now, and we have five active milestones. Milestones are how we keep track of uh, what issues we've triaged and then uh, kind of on what time frame we expect them to be, they, we expect them to be resolved. Um, we have three open 6xx bug fixes, which I know Dan is kind of Dan is on vacation until tomorrow, I think. So uh, when he gets back, I think one of his things is is starting a bug hunt, which should be really good timing for us to get 70 stable. Um, and then we have 56 open issues under the 70 miles, milestone as well. Um, I think we are planning on doing a 621 or something in the 6x series. Uh, so that we don't have to wait for 7.0, but that doesn't, we should still continue to get 7.0 uh, out the door as soon as we can. So um, I, I bled into the overall sort of thing, but um, overall we're getting close to a 7.0 alpha, which is kind of like the point as which at which we've um, kind of stabilized enough that like nothing super major is going to change, in particular the MPY version. We don't want to change again. Um, MicroPython 113 is merged in. 114 and 115 should be doable this week. Uh, the dynamic USB descriptor changes are merged in, and please try those. Um, and the status LED revamp is out for review as well. So those are kind of like all the things that could be pretty major changes that we wanted to do with 7. Uh, now's the time if you uh, want to help take a look at the issues list. I think there are things either tagged 7 or tagged breaking uh, changes that we should make sure and do in 7 unless we're actually trying to wait for eight for those. So um, we're getting there. It's uh, it's all good. Uh, please try main and, and find issues so that um, so that we can really get seven stable as, as quick as we can. All right, thanks, Scott. Next up is the libraries. 
So this covers all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore library name. It covers the bundle, the um, community bundle, and a couple other extras as well. Um, so overall, <coughs> across all the libraries rather, we had 31 pull requests merged from eight different authors and 11 different reviewers. Uh, leaving us with 61 open pull requests. We had 22 issues closed by 11 people and 8 opened by 6 people, leaving us with 304 open issues. Six of those are labeled good first issue. If you are interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, go to circuitpython.org contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. You'll find open pull requests, open issues, and um, some library infrastructure issues, as well as how to contribute to um, translating the CircuitPython core. Um, you can search the issues by label. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. If you're looking for something a little more complicated, Bug or Enhancement is an excellent thing to search for. And um, with any of the pull requests, if you're interested in uh, starting to help out with reviewing, feel free to comment on an open pull request. That's a great way to start um, with reviewing is simply to check the code, see if it looks right to you. If you have the hardware, test it and let us know that you did that. Um, and once you're more comfortable with it, we can actually upgrade uh, you to uh, joining our review team, at which point um, you'll actually be able to uh, submit official reviews and merge PRs and so on um, and help with the whole process. And the more reviewers that we have, the more authors we can support. So it's a very important part of the process and it's something we're always looking to see more people join up with doing. Um, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries, but there is a list of updated libraries in the, um, in the notes. And uh, I see that I did not actually do my little overall thing here. Um, overall, we've been seeing a lot of documentation updates. Um, I think that that is starting to come to a point where um, a lot of the documentation updates are done and that's been great to see. Um, I know that there's been uh, quite a few contributions to the community bundle, none this week, but um, I think last week we saw uh, at least two or three new libraries added to the community bundle and we're always looking for stuff like that. We're working on moving some libraries over to the CircuitPython organization on GitHub and once we do that we want to integrate those um, the issues and uh, open PRs and that sort of thing on those libraries onto uh, circuitpython.org slash contributing. So it'll still be a one place to go to find all that information. If you want to um, start contributing, uh, you won't have to search around to figure out where to go. Um, so that's, I think, next up on our list of things to do is to get, um, get all those things that we're moving over to the CircuitPython organization um, settled in their new home and then uh, get everything set up so that people have access to it um, where it is. And uh, that's about where we're at with the libraries. Um, Melissa's still out, so I will go ahead and read off the Blinka stats as well. Blinka is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython running on single board computers such as Raspberry Pi. There were 14 pull requests merged, which I believe is a huge number for Blinka, um, with three reviewers. There are um, five open pull requests at the moment. In terms of issues, there were 14 closed issues by five people and one open by one person, leaving 52 open issues. In terms of PyPI downloads, there were 9,933, and currently there are 72 boards supported by Blinka. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to call folks out for doing awesome stuff. Uh, it's a chance to highlight the great things that people in our community are doing and uh, just a chance to say thanks um, for anything that you've seen, either stuff that you've seen other folks doing or stuff that uh, other folks have done for you, etc. cetera. Um, this section is held in a round robin where I will start and then I will go down the list alphabetically if you are in the notes as uh, listening in or text only, I will read off your notes. If you are in the notes um, and you are available, I will call on you when I get to you. And um, yeah, that's 
that's about how hug reports goes. So I will get started. Um, first up, I have a hug for Foamy Guy for always stepping up to update things where needed in guides, etc. Thank you to Jose David for continuing to update documentation across the libraries to Phil B for helping me with some illustrator weirdness and to Phil and Adafruit for donating to the Pi Ladies auction at PyCon this year and for sponsoring PyCon. Next up is Kmatch. Hey, thanks, Katni. Uh, first hug goes to Scott. Thanks for all the encouragement and guidance on the Tiny Logic Friend project and uh, also for highlighting it on your deep dive this past week. Uh, thanks to Stargirl, Jerry Ann, and Matthias for uh, some guidance on extracting NeoPixel driving code out of the bootloader and getting it running on um, the M4 boards. So I appreciate the help and guidance on debugging. Thanks. All right, next up I have some notes from folks. First up is notes from Melissa, who says a hug report to Jeff for reading the Blinka notes last week. Um, then next up I have notes from Mark who has a group hug. And finally, I have notes from Naradoc, who is text only, who says a hug report to Hugo for testing the serial interface discovery tools on the M1 Mac, to Dan H for dynamic USB work and all the support and answers, to Scott for all of the MicroPython merging and merging and merging, and to Anecdata, Jerry N, and all of the help with CircuitPython gang. Next up is Scott. Hello. First, a hug report to Anecdata for adding the AP mode to the ESP32-S2. I think uh, that may have flown under the radar, and I think folks who are using the S2 will, will be really excited about that. So thanks to Anecdata for that. Uh, thank you to Katni for covering for the newsletter and then jumping right back into running this meeting. Really appreciate it. And a uh, hug report to my partner, Minigree, for helping me with Pandas and Python data science -y stuff this weekend. Um, it was a whole new world for me. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, next up, I have uh, notes from a bunch of folks as well. First up, uh, from Charles Barneford, a group hug. Next, I have notes from Dan, who says, to Jerry N and Naradoc for testing USB and USB HID fixes. To Naradoc for debugging the M1 Mac OS issues even without an M1, and to Hugo for help in testing and dumping out data for Naradoc to review, and to Scott for API discussions and review of the dynamic USB PR. Next, I have notes from David Glauda, who says, a hug report to Foamy Guy for whatever magical thing was shown on Show and Tell that push an image that you do in the browser to a Pi portal. Um, to Kmatch for a tiny logic friend contribution, and to Naradoc for help at 4 a.m. on board.display equals none, and the trick, which is if not has attribute board display, display .io .release dis underscore displays. And next up is Foamy Guy. Alrighty, thanks, Katni. Uh, first up this week, thanks to Jeff for integrating the library screenshot maker in with actions on the learn guide repo. The first, uh, we got the first successful run this week. So I was really excited to see that uh, all in place and running. Uh, thanks to PT and Lady Ada for giving me the opportunity to get more involved by making videos and blog posts. And then uh, last one for me this week, thanks to Stephanie and Anne for helping me get set up on the, uh, the blogging system. Great. Next up is Higher Effect. Effect, I can't hear you. You're lit up green like you're talking, but I don't actually hear anything. That was weird. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, cool. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, thanks to uh, Dan this week for reviews of the new sleep stuff and bug fixes and other things I submitted this week. Um, thanks to Krupus, uh, who is a contrib community contributor on the Adafruit NeoPixel module for pinning down a kind of a little rare bug that could occur there. Uh, thanks to Valhall for finding and testing problems with the Esperino Pico board. Um, that, uh, so that was a good find. It totally broke the board and he picked it out. Um, and uh, thanks to Anecdata for testing all the fixes that went into the supervisor run reason problem this week. And that's it for me. 
Excellent. Next up, I have notes from Hugo, who says, A hug report to Katni and Phil B for the work on the pinout generator. Fantastic looking and bonus points for accessible colors. And group hugs. Next up is Jeff. Oh, and I've lost my place in the notes. So I want to thank uh, Zoltan V923Z for letting me know that there were some build problems between Microlab and CircuitPython. We are going ahead at about a thousand miles an hour with all these changes, but um, those can affect their uh, GitHub actions. So I put in a pull request there that I'll mention later. Thanks to you, Katni, and to Scott for uh, covering the Discord meetings while I'll be gone for a few weeks coming up, and also a group hug. All right, thanks. Next up is Jerry. There's that mute button, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, thanks to Dan for the uh, all the work on the USB uh, HID improvements. All right. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, next up, I have notes from Jose David who says to code NIO, Ali Mustafa Shah, Dewalex, GitHub users for making their first contributions in CircuitPython, to Deharada for all of the help this week, and to Anecdata, Naradoc, and Dan H for the help on defining precision timing for boards. And that rounds out hug reports. Next up is status updates. So status updates is a chance for us to talk about what we've been up to since the last meeting and uh, talk about what we're going to be up to until the next meeting. Um, it's an opportunity to sync up on what everyone's doing, but it's also an opportunity for people to provide tips and tricks, uh, quick answers to questions, um, that sort of thing, uh, depending on what's going on. And if something turns into a longer discussion, we can always move it to in the weeds. Uh, this section is also held as a round robin where I will start and then move down the list alphabetically, uh, looping back around. Um, if you are uh, have notes in the document, um, I will and you are missing the meeting or text only, I will read them off. Otherwise, I will call on you when it is your time, and uh, that is how this will go. So I will get started. Um, so last week. Uh, finished up guide feedback from ages ago. I can't remember if I talked about that last week or not. Um, we get feedback on guides through the feedback link and it goes into a particular system and uh, I neglected to do anything with it for quite a while. Um, so it built up and uh, so I finished all that and that was good. Um, updated all the Adafruit RP2040 guides and the Funhouse guide with all of the existing templates. So now they all have um, blank uh, status LED um, I'm blanking on the others. There's four. Um, digital input with a button. Um, and then created templates for cap touch using pads or pins. So that'll work for both, say, a Circuit Playground, or it's two separate templates, one for things like Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, where it's actual touch pads, um, and one for, say, the Feather RP2040, where you're using the pins. And then also storage, uh, which is writing to the CircuitPython file system. Um, and then again, two separate templates, one for using a boot.py with, um, or two separate pieces of code, I think it's the same template, um, for using a boot.py using a ground pin or using um, boot.py using a pressed button. No, it's two templates. Um, and uh, those haven't gone into any guides yet, so they haven't been reviewed, but um, the plan is to update uh, the RP2040 guides first with all the templates uh, to get them deployed and then uh, move on from there. Um, Generated pinouts images for the RP2040 boards. Images have been uploaded to the respective PCB CAD file repos. So if you want to view what those look like, they were mentioned in hug reports. Um, uh, you can go to the um, PCB file uh, GitHub repos for the uh, Adafruit um, Feather RP2040, Itsy Bitsy RP2040, and QtPy RP2040, and those uh, there are SVG files available there. So this week, um, I'm going to be working on the I2C Rotary Encoder STEMI QT guide. It's a new uh, breakout board that's a rotary encoder that is um, got STEMI QT connectors on it, runs on I2C. It's super convenient. Um, 
I'm gonna, I didn't put this in my notes, but I'm gonna go through, I distilled the list of CircuitPython boards, Adafruit CircuitPython boards that don't have a board.led pin for the built-in little red LED uh, down to the list, down to a list, and uh, I'm gonna update that. Shouldn't take long, um, but it's something that I think needs to be done because we're trying to uh, make the code consistent. So blank code will use board.led um, and we need to have all the boards having that or we're obviously going to be running into folks having problems just like they're running into folks with uh, running into problems with um, D13 because D13 is not on all of them either. So um, we picked board.led to be the consistent one. And then um, I'm going to be doing some uh, very simple preparation for PyCon. Um, I want to host an open space and uh, some sprint stuff, um, but it's all virtual and there's no guarantee folks will have hardware, so I'm not really entirely sure what that's going to look like, uh, but that's on my plans. And then um, I'm also uh, going to be continuing on template stuff. Um, Friday, during Wednesday during the day, I will be unavailable because I will be attending the EDU summit for PyCon, and then on Friday... Um, the conference starts and then uh, Monday and Tuesday depending on what sprints end up looking like I'll be hosting sprints so I will be here for next week's meeting but I will obviously not be hosting as I'm hosting this week um, but wouldn't have been available to host anyway so that's my update um, and with that I will turn it over to Kmatch good thanks Katni uh, so I've been over the past several weeks primarily been working on a non CircuitPython project called Tiny Logic Friend, which is trying to make it easy to use these uh, development boards as a logic analyzer. So you can basically sniff signals uh, between some chips and see how they're really talking to each other. Um, and I got it to a point where I submitted my first pull request to a, a project called SIGROCK and PulseView. It's basically the software that can run on your on your uh, computer that, or your, your uh, PC that can help you visualize the signals that are coming back from a logic analyzer. So, so if that gets uh, accepted, it'll make it easy so folks can can use Tiny Logic for end boards uh, since they won't have to compile the whole software. Um, so that's that's in progress now. Uh, also, I built and uh, tested the Tiny Logic Friend uh, firmware on three different of the Adafruit Cortex M4 boards, and it's just as easy as putting it in bootloader mode and and sliding over a UF2 file. So um, there's a few available there. Uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned in my my, uh, my hugs, I, I uh, learned how to add NeoPixel indicators onto those boards. So I added that, uh, at least you'll have some sense of what's going on on the boards while it's measuring. Uh, as for this week, I want to see what, would, what it'll take to get uh, the same firmware onto an RP2040 board. Uh, and there's actually some good starting points from Mark Comus or Gamblor, and another Mark, Mark B139, who've done a lot of work to use the RP2040 to, to, as a logic analyzer. So I want to see if I can integrate their code into the Tiny Logic Friend driver, so you can have a wider array of boards available uh, as logic analyzers. And also want to so now that that pull request is kind of pending, uh, maybe uh, let that simmer for a while and get back to some Circuit Python work particularly looking at all the widgets that are in queue. So that's for this week. Thanks. Excellent. All right, next up I have some notes from Melissa to start with. Uh, over the last two weeks, was out last week due to symptoms from second COVID dose, wrote a guide on creating Funhouse projects using the Funhouse library, updated guide with temperature logger example, Wrote a guide on using the Funhouse motion sensor to turn a fan on and interface with Home Assistant. Fixed Blinka to work with MicroPython using the Pi board. Added Raspberry Pi Pico support to Blinka running MicroPython. And went through and closed and merged many issues in PRs for Blinka and Platform Detect. This week, update some e-ink guides with the new monochrome e-ink bonnet, continue going over Blinka issues, and start a new Funhouse guide. And next I have more notes from Mark Gambler, who says, work slash life has been taking most of my mental energy lately. Hope to be able to contribute more soon. Next up is Scott. Hello. 
So 113 is merged in, I believe. Um, 114 and 115 are started. I've done the merge, and I think the tests are passing, but I kind of like couldn't finish them until the previous releases is done. So I'll shoot to get 114 out for review today. Um, and then 115 will follow once 114 is merged in. Uh, they're both 14 and 15 are much smaller than than the previous ones, so I don't expect it to be too too difficult. Um, I made a PR for the status LED revamp. It um, minimizes how often the LED is on, so it's going to change the way that the boards look when they're running. Um, but it will save power, which is good, and it generally has the philosophy that the LED only blinks when it needs something from you. Um, so it should save power. Uh, I'm meeting with Damien and Jim later today for a chat, kind of like as the post-merge uh, chat about maybe there are some things that we can upstream to MicroPython that makes it easier for us to continue to merge going forwards. That'll be good um, debate later, and I'll, I'll, I'll recap it uh, next week um, if anything interesting comes from it. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, are the Python Language Summit as part of PyCon. Uh, I'm presenting a lightning talk uh, tomorrow late morning. Uh, it's just five minutes about comparing CircuitPython and CPython, which I'll talk about on my stream on Friday as well if people want to see what that is. Um, so, I mean, I have to actually practice it today um, and make sure that the timing is about right. Uh, so that's... Uh, what I'm doing today, overall, it's an odds and ends week. Um, you know, getting all these PRs in, um, being on calls a lot this week. Also, have a call on Wednesday with Trevor and Antonio. Antonio is a contractor that does mobile app development um, that we use from, that we work with from time to time. So, uh, Antonio is going to start working on the the Beely workflowy side of the mobile stuff along with Trevor. Um, so we should see more progress on that hopefully in the next few weeks. So I, uh, after I'm done with all these odds, odds and ends, the next thing is um, doing uh, the BLE workflow stuff and certify them proper. So that's going to be really exciting. And um, so that's where I am circuit Python wise. And then I just thought I'd mention on the non circuit Python front, I've been listening to uh, some broadband policy uh podcasts here in the US and and had some back and forth on Twitter with the guy that does the podcast and he said that you know what they really need is they need an open open broadband availability availability map in the US and in particular potentially with a even a basic model for like the cost of laying fiber uh to new communities uh the background is is that in the US here we have a lot of uh government uh money that's going to be going towards broadband. And so uh, making sure that uh, that data gets spent wisely is uh, part of the reason that having a map like this would be really useful. So uh, I started working on that. It was really interesting to do like data analysis, analysis sorts of things like joins and stuff. And uh, also getting back into map rendering things, uh, particularly with OpenStreetMap. So it's been quite interesting and I'm excited to to push something um, hopefully in the next week or two about uh, showing showing where fiber is and potentially how costly it would be to get it uh, further further out into other places. So that's that's my update. All right, thanks, Scott. Next, I have some notes to read. Starting with Dan, who says, finish the dynamic USB descriptors PR, which was merged. There were some bugs, and I have some PRs to fix in to fix those. Verifying that the Adafruit board toolkit is not working on M1 Max, which causes the board detection I added to Mu recently to not work. Naradoc has fixes. I will set these in motion. Thinking about how to make some kind of U recovery UF2 in case someone has turned off both MSC and CDC USB devices could be safe mode or other, or could be a file system eraser. I have a draft PR, but this is still a discussion topic. And finally, we'll be bug hunting for 6x and 7.0. Next, I have some notes from David Glauda, who says, continue to work on thermal camera with one code.py that work on multiple hardware with various bilinear interpolation scaling and display IO scaling, Pi Portal, Clue, Matrix Portal, and Featherwing Keyboard plus Feather S2 or Feather RP2040. And testing the new Pico to zero version 0 0.4 with pull up resistor. And next, I have notes from Fede2, 
who says last week adding support for the latest risk five boards to python platform detect and about to push changes to blinka this week continuing the translation of the circuit playground guide and st stocking any missing translations via or to spanish um via weblate api next up is foamy guy all right thanks kenny uh for the Last week, I finished up the majority of all the updates to learn guides to change from bus IO to board. Uh, but there are, I think, one or two more that I need to finish up this week. So that's my first item for this week as well. Um, back to last week, though, I created a, a short video um, that talks about the new requirement screenshot utility. And I also started working on the changes in cookie cutter to add org into um, project names if you don't select a different prefix. Um, and while I was working on that, I also fixed an, an unrelated thing that had popped up, uh, or I guess quasi unrelated, but it's um, the pip installation instructions that go into README. Those were hard coded with uh, Adafruit. So I got a PR out there to fix that now as well. Um, for this week, I'll, I'll be getting spun up on the, the blogging system and writing uh, my first post, which will cover that uh, video that I just mentioned. Um, I will finish up the last of those learn guide bus IO uh, updates. I will try to complete those changes in uh, cookie cutter to add org. And then um, I'm going to try to, there were a couple of folks interested in that Pi portal screen design management thing. So I'm going to try to polish that up and get it uh, published somewhere online so that other folks can try it out on their own Pi portal. That's what I got. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Next up is higher effect. Okay, so uh, this past week, uh, I fixed up some issues with the supervisor run reason. Uh, that's the reason returned when you first when you start up CircuitPython and you check try to check why it started up. Um, it should now correctly identify when it was opened by the REPL or the supervisor or an auto re reload caused by like saving your file, uh, or if it's the first startup, as opposed to just saying that everything was an auto reload, which is what it was doing previously. Um, uh, I fixed an issue with the Esperino Pico, which is neither an S ESP nor a Pico, but it's a very tiny STM32 board and it wasn't working, so now it does. Um, I did an overview of the Adafruit NeoPixel implementation based on some user feedback, uh, fixed a minor bug that could come up in some high performance cases. Uh, I fixed some issues in the RP2040 Deep Sleep implementation, uh, which should be up as soon as we get the Eternal Sleep revamp uh, merged. And uh, I started up on uh, reviewing the uh, next startup file code, which needs some uh, minor changes before it can be uh, put in. And so I'll be picking that up, which is one of our older PRs uh, in the queue. Uh, this week, I'll be reviewing Scott's new LE, status LED code, and make sure it plays nice with all of the sleep module stuff. Uh, I'll be catching the STM32 alarm up to date for what feels like the bajillionth time. It keeps getting messed up by all the cool new features we add. Um, I'll be starting the merge process for the internal sleep and alarm revamp, um, which actually should be a fair amount of work because it's going to involve all of the cruft cleanup for all of the ports that have had alarm uh, merged and maybe had little leftover issues. So um, that'll take up some time. And then uh, I've got the set next file PR to keep going on and uh, finishing up the alarm power profiling, so actually measuring how much power all these different boards with their new sleep modes actually use during sleep. So how long will their battery life be? What's kind of a typical use case? Getting all that documented and submitted. And then uh, for some fun stuff this past week, I ported the first couple chapters of the Genki Japanese textbook into my um, Python, CircuitPython uh, flashcard app thing. So. Um, hopefully I'll have some something to show on show and tell for that with some hardware uh, sooner rather than later. That's it for me. Excellent. Thank you very much. Next up, I have notes from Hugo, who says last week, work more, more work on rebranding, including templating and clobbing. Helped out Dan H. and Naradoc with the M1 Mac USB serial diagnosis. And this week, finish up rebranding. Next up is Jeff. Hello again. Uh, so last week and so far today, I've continued helping out with uh, mostly fixing tests during the merge process. I did a couple of short videos for the Adafruit blog. Um, one was actually supposed to go out next week, but they posted it up this week. It's all good. 
uh, contributed a fix to find imports, which is a Python project. They um, had a little bug handling files with a UTF-8 byte order marker at the beginning that affected the image, uh, the CircuitPy screen drive screenshot, the image maker maker. So that's fixed now, and it was fun to work with them on a new project. I've contributed some fixes for obscure C compliance bugs to both MicroPython and CircuitPython. Worked on some build failures in MicroLab, and I worked on the NatMod examples. Those do all now work in CircuitPython with a patch, um, but I'm also understanding that NatMod is really limited in what it can do. So it's not really a solution for expanding the capabilities of the low end boards and also because it needs uh, space in the Flash firmware. So you'd have to take two things out to add NatMod, and then maybe you could add one thing back. So I don't think it's going to be super useful for the low-end boards in CircuitPython. Um, and then the other thing that I did this morning is the Espressif Kaluga dev kit has its own camera and camera port. And I got that demo running uh, in the ESP IDF. There are some problems with the hardware. Uh, the images are sometimes corrupted. But hopefully, now that I know the code works, I will find it useful to study and possibly take parts of it for the Python implementation. So this week is more merge help if needed. Um, and then out of these three, we decided in the internal meeting that the next thing I was going to work on would be to work on the RGB matrix support for the ESP32 S2. And I will be missing the next two Monday meetings. My wife and I are taking a road trip. I will be doing lots of walking and a little like light hiking near Boulder, Colorado. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Next up is Jerry. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so mostly what I played around with a lot this week was just trying out the, the new versions of 7.0 after the MicroPython merges on as many boards as I could. And in most cases found very few, very few issues. Things are working really well, but ran into a really, really puzzling bug, uh, problem with USB, USB HID. There was a problem that all of a sudden it's started not working on, on any boards, I think, but that that's now been fixed by Dan and, uh, as a PR pending, um, I think ready to be merged for that. But as part of that, um, ran into another problem that still persists on, um, oh, well, it started out on the Perky M0, but since we don't like to talk about that board, I found that I can reproduce it on the CPX on the CircuitPython mm -hmm. Express as well. So that makes it a real problem. And, uh, it has to do with some really bizarre combination of IR remote and USB HID, at least I think so. So, you know, it's probably not going to bother a lot of people and, and it'd be nice to get these merges in and then try and figure out what this bug is. There's a new issue been opened on it. If anyone wants more details, you can ask, we can talk about it later, but uh, it's, it's pretty obscure, I think, but it's there. All right. Well, thank you for finding the obscure bugs. <laughs> All right, next up, I have some notes from Jose David. And Jose David says last week, most of the time working on libraries, open issues, reviewing some PRs from new folks, reviewing the uh, Gyro's Excel libraries, verify that we are returning standard um, SI units. Uh, changes were made in three libraries. This week, continue working on open issues and reviewing PRs. And that is status updates. So next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions, um, things that don't really fit in status updates, but that folks want to discuss. Uh, the first topic is Jose David, who I think is not in the meeting today, so I will read it off. Um, Library size versus boards. And then there's a link to an issue. If somebody could post that into the chat, that would be great. Sensor libraries with a lot of features will raise a memory error, a memory allocation error. In the issue above, Scott mentioned a possible check. Is this something still in the plan? Or do we mention that it, as a caveat in the readme in some libraries, such as, and then another link, um, which I will post in a moment here if nobody does. Um, another solution is preset some libraries with default values and avoid 
class build usage and all the registers in the libraries, but maintainability of having two versions could be cumbersome. Comments or ideas? I don't know if anybody has any comments on this. I mean, my my line on this has always been, I think we should, what we really need first is that we need a system to measure how big the libraries are mm -hmm. in CI. Um, because then we'll be, a, be able to actually tell how our changes are impacting things. Um, so that's, I think that's what I mean by possible, Jose is talking about with possible check. It's just like, we really should track it before we can expect to actually do a good job of of minimizing it. Um, so that that would be my challenge as folks is like I think what we could do is we could have like a QMU build of CircuitPython that you load, you do basically import, and then you just see the GC stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think one one thing that'd be really could be quite cool actually is like if we have that we could probably dump all the memory from QMU as well and actually build like a visual visualization of the memory taken by a module. So I think like, like I did ages ago for the, the heap dump stuff. So yeah, I think, I think that tooling is the thing that we need to really get us over this hump. Um, I don't think that two libraries is necessarily what we want. Um, although I could see like some sensors do a lot of different things. And so I think one way to approach it would be that like I would you you could split functionality based on functional lines of a sensor um, because there may be like some things that you just simply don't need except if you're doing some more advanced things. So I I think generally you don't want just two libraries for different sizes sake. Yeah. Um, but but if you did have like purposes different purposes for different things of a particular driver, then I think that would be okay. So. Um, I know this is an issue. It's a, it's an issue, especially as we have new bigger boards and we also do more library development on Raspberry Pi. It's just, um, it's inevitable. And I think, I think the, the solution is, is actually just exposing, exposing and, and making it clear the impact of the changes to the drivers uh, on the memory footprint. So, okay. That, that is a challenge that I pose to folks. <laughs> I don't have the time to do it myself. Right, right. Do you mean making the affected libraries into packages so only the needed functionality is imported? Yeah, that could be part of it. Yeah. Wait, it's wasn't that what Simon got on and was talking about the other day? I don't know. Or is that a little different? Where, where he was talking about like chopping out parts of the libraries to save space dynamically. He was, yeah, he was talking about doing it um, programmatically, right? Like programmatically trying to figure out like different segments of the uh, code and and potentially also like i think it, it was unclear whether it was like in take that data to inform how to split the code versus like simply post process all the code that you're running and delete all the code that just never gets called right i think there was the question of like is this happening at like load time or is this happening Right. Uh, on developer time preemptively right and i think so, that anyway. i think there could be some some cool uses of like we could actually only load function byte code once we know we're actually going to execute it like i think there are some interesting things we could do in circuit python to like lazy load things um, I think that his his context, Simon is, was trying to work on a uh, GUI and like a set of extension tools for Circup. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was thinking of this as basically being like something that's managed by a program running on your host computer, right. does all this optimization as you're working to right. minimize the amount of code that actually has to be on your, your file system. On your device. Yeah, and right. Hugo's pointing out it's called tree shaking usually. Yeah, is. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I, the, the whole thing seems neat to me, but it's not it's not something I know too much about. But I, I know there was a lot of confusion about like, what is this a runtime thing or a dev time thing? Right. I think, yeah, 
I think you have to do it as late as possible because if you do it too early, then you risk um, code not working like you expect it to work. Um, right. If you're doing it on the host side and you copy the files over and then you're reading and you're like, oh, I want to use this property and that property's not there because you <laughs> did the analysis before you were using a new property sort of thing. Right, you zapped it. Um, yeah. I think there's some interesting ideas. I just, like, it hasn't been a priority, unfortunately. Okay, sounds good. Um, next is a topic from me. Two topics. Um, first up, I saw something go by about Sphinx being updated. Um, I don't, I didn't look into whether or not we pinned Sphinx or not. Um, but it seems like something we should probably look into. <laughs> I changed something with the Sphinx config for CircuitPython core. Mm -hmm. Is that what you saw go by? No, no. I, I saw that Sphinx was just tagged like 4X, like 4.0 oh, or did something. They, yeah, they, I, really, I, they released an update, yeah. Um, and I don't know if we, that's why I'm saying I don't know. I, I did not look into whether or not we have pinned to some previous version or not. Um, so there's two sides yeah, to this. One, if it's least... pinned, um, we might want to look into updating. Two, if it's not pinned, we need to make sure all of our stuff still works. The core is pinned at less than three. Okay. I think, which is kind of outrageous, actually, now that I realize that we were a version behind. Yeah. Um, I'm all for keeping it up to date, but I don't know how much of a task it would be to... Yeah, I'll, I'll look into it. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so the thing, the thing that I changed was there's this um, the the thing that does markdown to RST mm -hmm. was called recommon mark, mm -hmm. and that was maintained by the redox read the docs folks, but it's kind of stale. And there was a there was a an issue that was breaking the CI with one of the merges, mm -hmm. and it turns out there's now a my st parser package that people are now using instead of recommon mark and that's the official like recommendation from the read the docs folks too so i switched that over um with the 113 merge okay i will look into that for the libraries as well okay. um and in that same look we'll figure out what we're running and what we want to do with updating and update it once and see whether or not we break everything and then move on from there Okay. okay, sounds good. Uh, thing two is um, it was suggested that we add a um, template to the library PRs. Uh, for those that don't know, that means when you open a PR um, on a library, there's text in the text box for the PR um, when you open it already, and it's like prompts. And that, that's already the case on the core if you pick bugger. Um, enhancement or whatever the two labels are um, where it just it sort of helps you like know what to put in there but I think the bigger reason why it was suggested was so that we can put information in there about um, pre-commit and uh, running pylint and black on your code before submitting your PR um, so far everybody I've mentioned to it's been on board I just wanted to bring it up um, in a also to verify the design guide yes it was jose david that made the um that made the suggestion so uh basically the template would suggest you know make sure you're following this design guide make sure that you've run the pilot and black on your code um it's I, go ahead i think it's a good idea but it also made me realize that i did that work to automatically follow up with a post if the ci fails correct and I don't know, like I thought, last I talked to Dylan, Dylan was gonna roll it out, but I haven't checked with them yet. I don't think that's so, happened. Okay. Which that, is actually I, a good I thing in the sense, both, that, yeah, is is that we could do both at the same time. Yeah. Um, because it's it's a matter of adding a file uh, to get the template in. It's just a file in a in a directory. I looked yep. it up. So, okay. Um, yeah, maybe doing them both at the same time would be good. Uh, sounds good. Um, Keen. All right. That was what I had. Um, thanks. Next up is Foamy Guy's topic. 
All right, this is uh, kind of follows out from the one that we t talked about last week, adding org to the name of these repos. So I started making the changes in Kirky Cutter, and I think I got it working to change the name of the folder of the project that gets generated. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me I didn't know if we wanted that to be on the PyPy name and the read the docs name and in the name of the Python file as well. So I figured I would ask instead of uh, um, trying to make my best guess. I don't with PyPI, I don't think it matters. Um, read the docs. It really doesn't matter either. Um, it because the the reason that we were changing that is so that we identified like the difference between the Adafruit ones and the ones that are on the Circuit Python org. Yeah. And I don't know that it mat for the for the dot pi file. I don't know that one. I I would leave to others, but for PyPI and read the docs, I don't think it matters. Okay. Um, in terms of the pi file, um, what is it? What would it? What would it look like now? You get so if you like the name of the library. If you put, for instance, display IO Cartesian, that's the one I've done a bunch of the work on. Mm -hmm. Then you end up with a file that's just called display IO Cartesian. I believe. Let me double check though. I think that's okay. I don't think org needs to be in the pi name. Yeah, that's correct. You end up with just display IO Cartesian, which actually, yeah, that makes sense. Since there's no circuit Python, then there should not be any org really. I'm yeah. not sure why. I'm not sure why I didn't catch that one. Okay. So we I won't put it in PyPy or read the docs, uh, but it will be in the the name of the folder. Uh, that's so great. I think I can finish that PR up uh, sometime later today or tomorrow. Excellent. For cookie cutter. Yeah. Agree with agree with Jeff for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's all I had. Okay. And that ends up in the weeds as well. Um, so with that, I will wrap up. Um, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for May 10th, 2021. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, considering purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. This video of the meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific uh, next week. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. And we hope to see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.